In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, His Excellency President Mohamed Bari has approved the employment of 774,000 Nigerians for special public works program in the country to curb the effect of the pandemic. A further breakdown showed that 20,000 monthly allowance will be given to the beneficiaries for a three-month period. And joining us to discuss this topic live is the Minister of State for Labor and Employment, Festus Kiyamu. Thank you, Mr. Kiyamu, for joining us on the show. Thank you for inviting me. All right, while we're going with the minister, we'll definitely come back with Dr. Charles Omali and also Dr. Philip Ekbe to continue our earlier discussion and they on the standby. Now, Mr. Kiyamu, first of all, the extended special public works program. Fantastic idea, but why now? Well, thank you so much. Better late than never. This is an idea that has um, some kind of historical uh, background. <laughs> was a that started in the early 1990s, um, the 20th century, or the 19th century, I mean, where during the Great Depression, um, the industrialized nations used this kind of program to lift their people out of poverty. Basically, the technique of the book is that during the dry periods, or during periods of great farming, or periods of um, great depression or droughts, because people would not be able to go to their farms and earn money from agriculture in those days, government needed to make people uh, keep people alive. So normally they would mobilize them, organize them, and then make them do public work, maintain public infrastructure for a fee. For instance, they will mobilize them to go and clear, you know, drainages, to go and um, maintain different public infrastructure and on and on like that. And for that, they will keep them going like that up to the point where the rains will come again, the farming will go, and then they will go back to their farms. So mostly this type of job was for itinerant workers in those days. But as time went on, this type of program was remodeled, repackaged, and given some kind of modern flavor by Asian countries, China, India, Bangladesh, and all of that. Now, so when you have a, a situation where some unskilled labor, unskilled labor are itinerant workers. You see them, I'm sure you see them every day. They don't have any skill. They, they go about with shovels, with holes, with rakes, with diggers, they stay by the roadside, they look, they wait for anybody to come and pick them, to come and do menial jobs. They carry concrete at times, they go to construction sites and ask for just anything they can do. Those are unskilled labor. And so, what the federal government is trying to do, like it happened in India and Bangladesh in those days, is to say, look, this kind of itinerant workers, they are going to engage them during the dry season period. The dry season period is the period where you can carry out so much public works. Because during the rainy season, it is difficult at times to engage people to work on, you know, uh, outside, uh, you know, uh, uh, covered areas. Because the rains will come, the rains will disrupt what they are doing, and they may not be able to work. So it's a, actually a seasonal kind of job. And it may be done on an annual basis. These people are normally farmers. They normally have some kind of trade. So when they save that money they earn during dry season, they go back and plough that money into their small businesses and wait for the next dry season, and they come back and do these jobs again. They raise more money, they go back to their farms and their businesses and plough the money in. All right, Mr. Kiyamo, so let, let me interject, Mr. Kiyamo. Now, 1,000 people from the 774 local government areas amounting to 774,000 Nigerians for the Special Public Works Program in the country with a 20,000 monthly allowance to the beneficiaries. Is this realistic? 20,000 monthly, so it's going to be 60,000 on the whole. Is this realistic? Hello. Yes, Mr. Kiyamo. It's going to be a total of 60,000 for the three months. A total of how much for the three months? 60,000. 60,000 for the three months, that's okay. 20,000 per month. Now, is this, yeah, is this realistic, Mr. Kiyamo? How realistic is this? Why 
Yeah, it is extremely realistic. Like I said, there are historical terms for this. And if you see, if you listen to my press conference today, we have devised a strategy whereby we are going to engage this number yeah. of mm. Okay. I agree that we have taken such a large, you know, kind of um, social intervention scheme in the past to be executed within a short period of time. But I thank Mr. President for reporting confidence in, in me to supervise the execution of this program, uh, the preparation and execution of this program, and that's what I'm doing right now. If you want to know the details, if your time allows in this, on this program, we shall go into the details of the preparation so far. Okay, let, let's look at an aspect of this program, that the program aims to promote mass employment strategies. But then again, its, it's, it's duration is only for three months. What, what happens to these beneficiaries after the expiration of these three months? The federal government has a lot of um, options for them. We are looking at all the, all the options. Uh, there is some school of thought that says, look, it's just like a pilot scheme also. Once it proves to be very successful, there's no reason why the federal government would not extend it. There's also no reason why the, 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 those beneficiaries that would have been captured, don't forget that we are taking their details, we are putting our BVN, we are having a database of these unemployed persons and unskilled labor. There's no reason why we cannot, there cannot be an exit strategy where we migrate them to some kind of you know, agricultural scheme. Because, you know, we are a country that we are badly in need of, you know, boosting our agricultural sector. We have been so dependent on oil and oil prices are going down. So the federal government has all kinds of options. They can migrate these people to some kind of agricultural scheme, mass agricultural scheme, or some, some other kind of mass uh, uh, public um, works. So, but the most important thing is to first capture them, use them for three months, pay them off, see the impact it has on the economy, and the federal government will take it from there. Now, many Nigerians want to know, is this program open to all Nigerians in the unemployment bracket or to, to just Nigerians who lost their jobs due to the economic crisis brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic? It is open to all Nigerians, but mostly unskilled labor. But for some of people who are skilled and who are unemployed, the better for it, you know? Some people may say, look, I don't have a job, even though I'm skilled, but 60,000 for three months is a lot to me. We can make use of those people. For instance, it's not all the 1,000 persons that will be unskilled. The, we, we have collaborated with other ministries. The president directed that we collaborate with other ministries. So we are collaborating with about eight other ministries that have their own projects they want to execute. So the president directed that we should take advantage, other ministries should take advantage of this program. Those ministries that have rural content in their mandates. For example, the Minister of Agriculture has a lot of rural roads they want to do. Some other pro uh, Minister of Environment have a lot of, has a lot of rural programs. Mr. President said these ministries should take advantage of this program, take advantage of the manpower available, and execute some of their projects. The, National, the Ministry of Finance, through the uh, National Bureau of Statistics, they have also made arrangements to take 10, 10 people out of this 1,000 per, per local government to carry out special service in all of these 774, uh, 774 local governments. You agree with, that, you agree with me that those 10 people must be literate that we want to give to the MDS to carry out their survey within that three months. They must be literate. So it's going to be a mixed bag, but basically it's open to all Nigerians, but it is designed for unskilled labor. So Mr. Festus, um, just, for, just for emphasis and reiteration, the selection preference here is for unskilled labor. The design, the design is for is for the selection labor. preference. The design of the program is for unskilled labor. Okay. The, the, it is the historical analysis template is for mostly unskilled labor. But there is nothing that will prevent us, nothing that will prevent us from extending it. So even those who are skilled, who are in, in need, who are unemployed, but in need to get engaged for three months, to do something for three months, if they think that the money is worth their while, we will give them, you know, some opportunity. But not, not, um, not a, a majority, not a majority of the opportunity. All right. Intimate us with, with the process and how transparent you think this will be. Now, if you listen to my press conference, I inaugurated a, an interministerial committee about uh, four weeks ago, and uh, they deliberated extensively and made recommendations to me. And um, under section of the uh, ND Act, as a supervising minister, I have powers to set up various committees 
for special purposes. And so what I thought, uh, based on the recommendation of the committee, was that the best thing to do would be to make this a local affair. We, I cannot pretend or we cannot pretend to be in Abuja here and then making selections for different states, different local governments that are far away from Abuja. So the first thing we have decided to do is that I have, I have directed that we are going to have state selection committees to make it very local. And so each state of the federation will have a 20-man state selection committee. And that selection committee will select the personnel and the projects. And guess what? The state selection committee is a mixed bag of all kinds of interests that there's no way that it will not cover different strata of society. For instance, the chairman of Khan, Christian Association of Nigeria, will be a member, the state chairman. The state chairman of uh, the National Council of Islamic Affairs will be a member. The, chair, the state chairman of National Union of Road Transport Workers will be a member. The governor will have a representative on the panel. The, the state market woman leader will be a member. A prominent civil society organization will have a representative in that uh, uh, committee. They will have two, two members, two, two persons from each of the senatorial districts, one male and one female, representing youth organizations in that state. They would be members of that committee. Uh, the traditional institutions will also have one, one representative from each of the senatorial districts. The traditional rulers would also be represented on that, in that same committee. And then we have a slot for two persons representing special interest in those states. States that have regions and states that have some groups that are peculiar to those regions and are powerful within those regions. I'll give a wild example, even though it's not in particular, uh, not that I'm particular about it. For example, the Ohaneze in the, in the Southeast is peculiar to the Southeast and they are very important to the people of the Southeast. There's no way why, why that the Ohaneze or the Ohaneze youth will not have some representatives on that committee. We have the Afeni Fera in the West. We have the Mieti Allah in some other places. Those, those organizations and interests that are peculiar to those states, they will have two representatives in, of course, that committee. Oh, the NG states... Yeah, Mr. Kiamu, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me cut you, let me cut you in there. Now, in your supervisory capacity, how, how long do you reckon this election process might take? Two months, we should wrap up. Because the program begins in October. So we're already tight on schedule. And that is why I had to come out with the criteria today. And we are going to be aggressive about it. And we are going to work closely with the banks. Mr. President has said we should work with selected banks for the purpose of capturing these people. There's not going to be any hanky-panky because they are going to be have, they are going to be registered, they are going to have their BVN. So the 774,000 Nigerians, we have 774,000 accounts with names and BVN numbers. They will be paid directly from the central bank. It will not come to the ministry. There will be no, 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 no room for uh, shady practices. Now the federal government is actually looking for ways to fund the budget. It even intends to revise its 2020 budget. How does it intend to fund this operation? Well, this is one of the priority um, areas the federal government is looking at. Because, uh, like we say, a, a, it's, only take, take, it's only people who are alive that can work. It's only take people, who are, people who are alive that can enjoy life. So uh, the federal government is concentrating its effort now on uh, social intervention. The priority for this government at this time is to ensure that Nigerians, especially the poor ones who have borne the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic, they stay alive. And so that is why the federal government has voted the 500 billion Naira social intervention fund to fund different types of social intervention. This program will only take about 50 something billion out of the 500 billion. It's only about 50 something billion in terms of the, in terms of the, the uh, allowances that will be paid and then the logistics to carry out the jobs. Now, the, the Zainab Ahmed, the, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, um, in a briefing disclosed that about 60 billion was already set aside from the COVID-19 crisis intervention fund for the project, basically for allowances and operational costs. Is this correct? Yes. Correct, that's correct. If, if yes, why from the COVID-19 crisis intervention fund? Well, you just asked now how it will be funded. Yeah. If you have any other suggestion why it should be taken from anywhere, then let us know. The, make, the basic thing is to provide succor to the very, very poor. If you, are, if you feel that the very poor in society do not deserve part of the COVID fund, then you can say it. 
You can see your reason. Yeah, because yeah. many people, a few Nigerians have said, shouldn't it rather be used to get equipment to increase testing and capacity to curtail the spread of the pandemic that we're dealing with currently? It's a two-pronged approach. At the same time, when you are trying to test people, you also don't want people who, are don't, who don't have jobs, who have lost their jobs, you don't want them to die of hunger too. You want to treat diseases, and you also want to treat the stomach too, that is, hung, that is empty. Mr. Kiamu, Nigerians often get co um, concerned that the problem with initiatives like this is that political beneficiaries always hijack the process. Nigerians want to know what is being done to avoid this kind of situation. If you, have you listened, have you read my press um, statement? Partly. We, first, the first check we put in place is that no member of that selection committee should be a, 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 an official of any political party. That is the first thing we have done. No political party will control that process. The 20 members must not be officials of any political party. And that is why you see people there like the religious leaders, the traditional rulers, the National Union of Road Transport Workers, civil society, youth of, they are there. They are there to checkmate the process. So where else can we go beyond that? If we can't rely on our traditional rulers, if we can't rely on the religious leaders, Khan, and it's like the, the National Council of Islamic Press, where do we go from there? Tell me where do we go if we can't rely on them to make, to make uh, the process uh, apolitical and um, as, 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 as credible as possible. What has been done to, to ensure civil society and the media can monitor the process and transparency? Luckily, the president approved that um, we should adopt um, online tracking. The president approved the use of technology uh, for me to, to use to monitor and track this program. And that would be wonderful. So what we want to do is to open a website first. In the ne next few weeks, the website will be up and running. And that website, we are going to, it's going to be an interactive website where the members of the public can easily go and see exactly what is going on. For instance, on the website, you are going to have the 36 states of the Federation and have Abuja. So when you click, for example, Delta State, Delta is my state. So let me use as an example. You click Delta State, the first thing that comes up will be the names of the 20-man committee and their contacts. People can contact them in that state to make a case for their inclusion and on and on. It's going to be a local affair. So let them make a case for them. The uh, chairman of Khan will contact all the churches in that state to say, look, can I have three, three names from all the churches, four, four names that the case may be. So yeah, the churches are going to benefit. The head of the Islamic Council in that state will say, look, can I have names from the mosque so that even the Muslims will benefit from the mosque. So when they do all of that, then they'll bring them on the table. As that case, when you now click, you now upload all of these names on the website. So even the beneficiaries from that state, when you click a local government in Delta State, you will now see all the beneficiaries in that particular local government. You click projects, you will see the projects to be executed in that local government. You will see the street name, you will see the exact projects to be executed, so that the members of the public, when they now, when the time reaches, when the time comes to execute these programs, somebody can come out on his streets. I said, look, they are supposed to be clearing this drainage. I am here. This drain, there's nothing happening on this drainage now. Because you in your website, you said, this drainage is part of your public work. But nothing is happening there. The person will interact, we send a mail, we chat on the website, and we can sell this, tell the, the, the state coordinator, the state supervisor to go to that place and report back as to what is happening. So it's going to be a public participation in this process. It's going to be transparent, it's going to be open for everybody to follow. Finally, Minister, let me, let me let you go. Um, will, will government leave itself open for scrutiny as a form of checks and, and balances? That is what we have done by making the process open, okay. by making the process transparent. The names of the beneficiaries are going to be there for everybody to see. The names of the committee members are going to be there for everybody to see. What more can we do beyond that? Minister of State for Labor and Employment, Mr. Festus Kiamo, it's been a pleasure having you join us on Plus Politics, and thank you for your contribution and for your insightful time with us tonight on the show. Thank you very much. God bless you. That's our conversation tonight. I'll give you my take shortly. Here is my take. There are now concerns about the increasing number of confirmed cases 
And this is because very high cases could seriously exceed the capacity of our health systems to cope. This, the Minister of State for Health clearly stated. At present, the country only has a total of 112 treatment and isolation centers in all 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory with 5,322 beds, 24 beds. Why only five states, including the FCT, have at least 300 beds as prescribed for isolation and treatment, 21 states have less than 100 bed spaces. As the number of confirmed cases increases, there is an urgent need to expand our treatment centers across the country. I therefore call on the state governors and philanthropists to take active and deliberate steps to scale up the number of beds for isolation and treatment of confirmed cases in their states. So, I will urge our sub-nationals to really consider their decision in allowing for large gatherings to take place until when we're fully prepared. I also urge the state governments to ensure compliance to restrictions guidelines, take community ownership to the grassroots. It is imperative for each of us to take personal and collective responsibility for the containment of the spread of COVID-19. And that's our show for tonight. More interesting conversation comes your way tomorrow, same time on Plus Politics. Until then, stay safe and be well. I am Benny Ark.